everyone. I'm Barbara C. Phillips. I'm a nurse practitioner and I have been teaching about business and professional development for about 10 years now to advanced practice clinicians through speaking and writing and course development and a lot of different activities. One of the things that I've been doing is I have been answering a question every single week to our email subscribers. But one of the things that I haven't been doing is I haven't archived any of those questions of the weeks and the answers and discussions that we've had anywhere at all. They've only gone out to our email subscribers. So in order to get this information out to more of you and to make sure it is it's a record somewhere, I'm now going to be doing it through this format, through audio and video and sharing our content on our YouTube channel, as well as Facebook, our blog, and a lot of other places that we can share this content. So I welcome you to join us for the ride. Now, before we get started, I want to just give this disclaimer. I am not a CPA. I am not a lawyer. And there are times you're going to need those professionals to answer some of these questions. So I really implore upon you, regardless of what you are hearing from me, you do your due diligence because everything is subject to change and your state rules, your situation may not be the same as how I'm answering these questions. So please do your due diligence. Now I'll tell you more about me and Nurse Practitioner Business Owner and Clinician Business Institute at the end of the video. So let's get started. So my question today is what reimbursements am I allowed? Now this is a question that came up in our Facebook group and that's at facebook.com forward slash nurse practitioner business and it's open to advanced practice clinicians but we do need to know that you are an advanced practice clinician before you can join us. So here's the actual question that that person asked and I've kind of broken it down into bullet points just to make it a little bit um, easier to read. So this is an MP who works in family practice and the manager, she says, if the doc is in the building with me, I get 100% of the payment, but if I'm alone, I only get 80%. She further goes on to talk about the manager doesn't seem to think that she can see new patients without the doc seeing patients too, and said something about Medicare rules. But then she ends with, but we can run our own practices, so this makes no sense to me. Well, there's a couple of different things going on in this particular question. And the first one that I want to address is such an important one that a lot of us get we don't understand it. The physicians we work with don't understand it. Not all practice managers understand it. And that is the whole idea of Incident 2. Now, Incident 2 is something just for Medicare. It doesn't apply to any of the other insurances. And there are some very specific rules that go along with Incident 2. But first, you need to understand what it's there for. You and I get 85% of the physician allowable in terms of reimbursement from Medicare. Physicians get 100% of the physician allowable. So what happens with Incident 2 and why people like to use it is, when the billing is done, Incident 2, the physician's visit and plan, then 100% of the revenue is, is allowed. I'm not gonna say received because that doesn't always happen, but is allowed. But but like I said, there's some very specific issues here. So the first one is, and I have it right here, the nurse practitioner or the PA has to be employed by the physician or the physician group. Okay, so you can't be an independent contractor in that particular practice. The physician must be in the office suite. So if it's a big office building, physician cannot be in the cafeteria, cannot be out of the office at the restroom, whatever the case may be, he or she has to be in the suite where you are seeing the patient. They don't need to be in the room with you, but they do need to be present and accounted for in the office suite. The physician has to see that patient first. They have to go in, they have to evaluate the patient, they have to, let's just say it's somebody with a simple hypertension, they've, they've decided to put this person on an ARB such as lisinopril, and then send the patient on their way. That patient can come back and see the nurse practitioner or the PA to follow up 
on the hypertension for the lisinopril. You can't see them for anything else. If that is the case and everything is good and there's no problems with the medication and you're continuing on with the plan, that's when something can be billed incident to. But the moment that that person has a problem with the medication, they've had some kind of a side effect, or they turn around and tell you, well, you know, I'm also having a lot of st stomach pain or I'm having some problems breathing, then you've got a whole new problem and incident two is out the window. But here's the biggest issue for me with incident two. I mean, we'd all like to get reimbursed at the maximum amounts that are allowed. However, when a practice is billing incident two, you as the nurse practitioner, as the physician assistant, are not getting credit for the work that you're doing. So your work becomes invisible because the billing is done under the physician's NPI number, not your NPI number. That is going to make a big difference in terms of how we track and, and can find out what we're actually doing and the outcomes we're having, but it's also gonna make a really big difference in terms of macro, particularly if you're not reporting under the MIPS under your own NPI number because that information goes with you wherever you go. And so down the line, if you're not reporting because this information is being done under incident two, your reimbursement rates are probably going to go down. And again, keep in mind, this is only for Medicare. Now, the other issue here is the understanding of reimbursement rates. So with reimbursement in Medicare, the, the posted um, published reimbursement rates, those are physician rates. So as a nurse practitioner, as a PA, we are allowed 85% of the physician allowable. So we have a 15% discount applied to us. Now of that 85%, anytime it's billed under our NPIs, that's what we're allowed, the total allowed, Medicare actually only pays 80% of that amount. That other 20% is considered co-insurance and that is what the patient has to pay or that patient's secondary. And if that patient does have a secondary, oftentimes the secondary insurance will say they'll pick up 85 or excuse me, 80% of that 80% and there's still another 20% that the patient has to pay. So sometimes the patient ends up paying, you know, four or $5 from that original visit if there is a secondary. But that co-insurance is something that the patient is responsible for. And that is true with all commercial plans as well. Now, the difference is with a commercial plan, it could be that the co-insurance might be not 20%, but it might be 30%, 40%, even 50%. And occasionally it can be higher. Now, Medicaid, usually there's not a copay or a coinsurance with that, depending again on the plan. But as far as the reimbursement, it varies. I have seen 60% of the physician allowable, which quite frankly is not enough money, up to 100% of the physician allowable. With commercial insurance, there's a little more variability. We don't know. Those rates are not published. They're considered proprietary information to that particular insurance company. However, Medicare, Medicaid, Workers' Comp, those are all public insurances, and so anybody can look up those rates. So I hope that that helps and it clears it up at least a little bit in terms of trying to figure out what you're supposed to be getting reimbursed. But again, if you can at all, avoid the incident too. By the way, that is also something that has been targeted in the past and will likely be targeted again in the future by the Office of the Inspector General when they do their work audits for the year because it is an area of fraud. Likely, I'm going to assume that at some time in the not too distant future, Incident 2 will probably be done away with, especially as we move more to a value-based system. So if you have any questions, I want to invite you to submit them. You can do so at the bit.ly um, 
you can do so at the bit.ly shortener that's up here. So just bit.ly bit.ly forward slash Q-O-W for question of the week. You can also send an email to nppohelp at gmail.com. I invite you to take a look at our blog. Like I said, we've been publishing it for over 10 years, and you can find that at npbusiness.org. You can also sign up for our email list there. There's a number of downloads that you can get for free. So if you're looking for a course on professional development, how to start your practice, things like credentialing or how do you collect money from your patients, those sorts of things, you'll find that over at Clinician Business Institute. And once again, I invite you to check us out on Facebook, our Facebook page. You can friend me on Facebook or join our group at Nurse Practitioners in Business or NP Business. So until next time, thank you for watching and we'll see you later. Bye-bye now.